Hi, everyone. Welcome back to session two, uh, Modeling Abnormal Beliefs. Um, I have um, uh, the pleasure to introduce Daniel Hauke. Uh, he's a senior PhD student uh, in my lab in the Cognitive Network Modeling team. And today he's going to um, provide uh, some applications of the models that we've discussed and also go through the MATLAB tutorial. Um, so once again, I remind you, um, please um, uh, pull uh, the latest code uh, from day six. Um, and, you know, if you want to follow along, um, Daniel will uh, start with uh, some theoretical uh, framework um, that will be useful for interpreting some of the results of the tutorial. So uh, take it away, Daniel. Thank you very much. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad you're here uh, and that you made it. Um, for some of you, it might be very early, but uh, some um, might also watch this later. So uh, welcome, everyone. And as Andrea said, we are now at this uh, second uh, uh, appointment today. And this will also be the first tutorial. And I will first um, actually show you some examples of how we use this model that you have heard so much uh, about now this morning uh, to investigate clinical questions. And then in the second half, I've prepared some scripts that walk you through um, the first steps using the model. And we will also get to some interesting simulations and you will uh, be able to simulate your own agents and uh, we will use MATLAB for that. So as Andrea said, um, please download MATLAB using, you can use the free license or your own license um, and uh, update the code uh, because we've made changes, I think on Friday to it. Uh, so it's it's better if you just make sure that it's up to date and you can still do so while I'm presenting you these empirical results now. All right. Um, so, we are particularly interested in, in schizophrenia, or I am uh, specifically interested in that. And uh, it's, a, it's a severe mental uh, disorder affecting about 1% uh, of the population. And one particularly uh, interesting symptom to me, and also one symptom that is associated with a high burden for patients are paranoid delusions. So these are the beliefs that um, people are out there to harm uh, oneself. And they are defined as uh, rigid beliefs that are persistent to change, uh, uh, remain despite evidence to the contrary. And uh, they are also associated with increased suicide risk and higher relapse rate. So as the primer for this uh, tutorial, I, I want to show you how we try to understand um, persecutor, uh, persecutory delusions and how they emerge and uh, uh, and persist. And to when you model a phenomenon, a clinical phenomenon, um, the first thing that that we did was to try to understand what the patients actually report. So what what do they say, patients that uh, have schizophrenia? And here is what one patient reports. He or she reported, "My senses are sharpened. Sights and sounds possess a keenness that I've never experienced before." Another uh, patient reports, I had to make sense, any sense out of all these uncanny coincidences. I did it by radically changing my conception of reality. Now, if we um, want to, to model uh, early psychosis, it's, it's also worthwhile to take a look at how symptoms develop over time, what's the longitudinal cause of the disorder and in, in many patients, actually, the psychotic episode is preceded by an at-risk phase, uh, which is characterized by symptoms that are not as severe uh, as the full-blown psychotic symptoms um, or shorter in duration, for example. So they might have hallucinations, but less frequently. They might have um, some uh, bizarre ideas, but they are not really entirely convinced of them. And um, this is then, of course, uh, followed by treatment and might reoccur after relapse and so forth. So if we look at this time course, uh, for many patients, it's not li like these symptoms appear out of nowhere, although there are some 
in which this uh, happens quite fast. And if we now take these patient uh, testimonials and, and place them in these different phases here, for example, my senses are sharpened in the at-risk phase, and then I had to make sense, any sense out of all these uncanny coincidences when the delusions uh, form and uh, the person is convicted that these are uh, the case uh, in a later stage. So how can we basically explain this using the model that you've seen so far? So just to remind you, the model assumes that a person uh, generates continuously generates predictions about the world, which are weighted by belief precision, and then gets some inputs from the world and then uh, updates uh, her uh, or uh, his beliefs via these um, prediction errors that are weighted by the sensory precision. So if we look at this uh, phenomenological perspective, my senses are sharpened, then this could be expressed as an increased uh, uh, or aberrant prediction error. And this can be uh, achieved by two computational mechanisms. For example, increased sensory precision here, uh, which would lead to the prediction errors that come from the, or are generated by the inputs of the world, come from the bottom up uh, to have a high impact on the model. And uh, this phenomenon has also been described in schizophrenia and sometimes uh, termed aberrant salience. So having experience and uh, experiences uh, prediction errors when there might not need to be some prediction errors. And because these prediction errors actually signal saliency of something so that something is important and you should probably take this into account and update your model. Another way to uh, to get to these prediction errors having a larger impact is to lower your sensory precision of, of your predictions. And if we look again at the um, update equation of the hierarchical Gaussian filter, you can see that delta mu, so the change in beliefs or the belief update is proportional to a prediction error. This is the, um, the delta here and the ratio of precisions. And uh, you can see that um, either by increasing the sensory precision here, you would uh, weight this update more, you would change your beliefs more, or by lowering the belief precision, you would also update your internal model more. And of course, these explanations may not be mutually exclusive. And what if we look at the second phase? So what happens when a patient reports, I had to make sense, any sense out of all these uncanny coincidences? So one way to think about these prediction errors is that they signal that you would need to change your model of the world and your model uh, changes rapidly and becomes brittle. And one way to actually stabilize your internal model would be by increasing your belief precision because then you would be able to explain away the prediction errors uh, that are generated maybe by abnormal do dopamine processing. And you can explain them away by a compensatory increase of your belief precision. And this was um, an idea that we brought forth and I think it's, it has been posted in the chat. Uh, the paper uh, pertaining to that has been posted in the last session. It's in, in molecular psychiatry and um, you can read about this uh, if you're interested. But this was the essential idea. And we can now simulate uh, belief trajectories for these two different um, stages and you can see this in, at the bottom of this panel here so you can see that if we simulate a, a drift in the volatility which increases to higher levels this would lead to um, high updates at the at the bottom level here of the hierarchical Gaussian filter and if you uh, basically stabilize the volatility then you would update less and this may be achieved by different parameters so so in essence, the idea is that maybe the initial stage, the early stage of psychosis is characterized by a, a decreased precision of the posterior or in, increased variance, more uncertainty. And when delusions form, you might actually compensate for that by increasing the belief precision and uh, thus having a, a more narrow posterior distribution. So this is all 
uh, good and well, but um, is it really the case? Um, and there we looked, we, we are currently investigating this, whether it's it's what, what happens. And um, Andrea actually uh, designed a task that uh, allowed us to probe social learning because paranoid delusions are a symptom that is inherently social. So it's, um, it, uh, evolves in the social domain because it's uh, it's basically the belief that other people have uh, malevolent attentions towards oneself, and it's still of course it's still debated whether uh, it can also be caused by a non-social process. So this is still out there, but um, at least to increase the chances uh, chances that we that we tap into the process that is relevant here, we use the social learning task, and. Um, in this task, a person has to predict the outcome of a binary lottery. Uh, you can see that this is basically this pie chart here at the bottom, which indicates the winning probability of the lottery it can be green or blue. And we call this the non-social queue. And the person, in addition to this non-social queue, also receives a social queue in form of a video recording of an advisor holding up either a green or a blue card. And to be, to, to come to the best decisions, people need to in integrate these two sources of information. And to make things interesting, actually the advisor originally was incentivized uh, to ensure that there were periods where the advisor would be helping the participant and other periods where the advisor would try to mislead the participant. So periods of competition and collaboration. And these are the corresponding papers here. Uh, and the key features of this task are that these recommendations uh, of the advisor were, were ridicule because they were based on, uh, on trials from a true interaction between two players uh, and taken from trials where the advisor was truly trying to mislead or help the participant. And these were extracted from a, do a dominant strategy to uh, control the input across participants for future applications, for example, using fMRI here in the scan paper. And uh, another key feature was that the uh, volatility of the advice uh, was changing over time. So the advice was not always uh, helpful, uh, let's say 80% in the cases, but this was actually changing over the time, uh, course of the experiment. And now what happens in clinical populations? And this is data that we collected in, in Basel and it's data from 15 unmedicated uh, first episode patients uh, where unmedicated was defined as less uh, or equal uh, to seven days of antipsychotic medication, 16 individuals at clinical high risk for psychosis and 16 healthy controls that were matched to the high risk patients for age, gender, handedness and cannabis consumption. And um, how did we formalize uh, our hypotheses of how learning could be altered in early psychosis? So there were two models that were we, uh, we were particularly interested in. Uh, the first model was um, the vanilla version of the HEF that uh, Andrea also introduced and has also used in a 2014 paper. And there are two parameters here that are of particular interest. But before I get to them, I would um, I would like to uh, illustrate how this model, what these hidden states represent in the context of this task. So it basically assumes that uh, a person tracks the advisor's fidelity. So the, the a person that is playing this game tracks how trustworthy the advisor is and uh, has a prediction of whether the person will be trustworthy or not. And, um, and then uh, once the person sees the outcome, so the person knows whether the advisor was trustworthy or not, then the state will be updated via uh, an outcome prediction error here or advice prediction error. And importantly, this model, as it has uh, another level here, also assumes that people uh, learn about the volatility of the advisor's intention. So how fast the environmental context changes. And this belief is updated via volatility prediction errors, the high level prediction errors here. And two parameters that are of particular interest in, in the context of psychosis are kappa and uh, omega here, because they represent, omega represents the tonic component of the learning rate and kappa can be viewed as a phasic component of the learning rate. And if you 
if you um, remember from the dopamine system, there are also tonic and phasic dopamine responses. And maybe uh, those might map to, to these signals and help us to, to infer on what's going on there. And that's why we are, were interested in these parameters uh, using this model. And this was the first hypothesis. And the second hypothesis was actually a, another model that in addition, uh, that assumed that in addition to uh, learning via prediction errors, the estimated volatility was also drifting to, uh, towards an attractor point, M3, uh, over time. And this conceptualizes the idea that there might be an altered perception of volatility going on in, in this population. And uh, thus two other parameters, so the initial uh, estimate of the volatility and the point to, towards which it drifts over time were the parameters that we are interested in this model. And here is another overview of the two, um, two models. And let's now jump into the data. So we first performed Bayesian model comparison and it was not uh, quite conclusive. The drift model was uh, the best model, but it wasn't conclusive. And then we looked at the different subpopulations and an interesting, so per group basically, and an interesting pattern emerged here. So you can see here displayed the uh, model attribution. So the probability that uh, model I uh, best explains subject J, and you can see that um, in the healthy control group, uh, the HEF was selected at, at as the most probable uh, probable model here to explain the healthy controls, whereas in the first episode group, the uh, AR1 model, so the model that assumes an altered perception of environmental volatility, appeared to be the best explanation. And uh, it's so this would be evidence maybe for an altered perception of environmental volatility in first episode patients because the uh, drift appears to be necessary uh, in this population. And um, it's also interesting to note what ha uh, what happens here in the high risk uh, participants, because there was more heterogeneity here in the model attribution. So they were showing a somewhat mixed picture. And um, this is quite interesting because actually the, the high risk, uh, out of the high risk patients, only 20 to 30% uh, will develop a psychotic disorder. So while it's termed high risk, there's actually still uh, way for improving the predictive accuracy of, of this uh, phenotype. And maybe these model parameters could help us to identify uh, individuals that are more likely to transition to um, psychotic disorder later on. Um, Daniel, um, sorry, uh, just uh, um, one thing. There's a question. Um, about uh, the significance of the two parameters in greater detail. So I think I'm assuming um, the uh, the two parameters that we hypothesize to be different in the second model uh, yeah. showing the drift. Um, mm -hmm. If you could, um, yeah, exactly clarify. Yeah, so um, U30 is basically the parameter that determines where your estimate of volatility starts. So what you expect how volatile you expected the environment to be at the beginning of the experiment and m3 is a parameter uh, so it can be uh, for example a high value a positive value uh, and higher than the prior then this would mean that you're experiencing the environment as more volatile over time it could also be a negative value uh, and lower than the prior then this would mean that you experience the environment as more stable over time. And it could also be the prior itself, which means that you sort of drift back to your prior beliefs over time. And uh, we will see more about these parameters. Uh, I think that uh, this will be clearer also in the tutorial where um, we can actually simulate from these parameters and, and discuss uh, what they mean uh, looking at the simulation. So this is actually part of the tutorial later on. Great, thank you. All right. So, um, because, yeah, actually, it's a, it's a quite a good transition now uh, to this part because, as I just explained, there are different ways M3 could be changed uh, in, in these populations. It could either mean that uh, participants perceive the environment as increasingly volatile over t time or increasingly stable. 
and uh, of course our our hypothesis would be that that they would perceive it as increasingly volatile over time um, we were interested in looking at at this parameter in particular across the three groups and you can see in this plot here that uh, m3 was increased in the first episode uh, psychosis patients so indeed what we find uh, using this model was that the intentions were perceived as increasingly volatile over time uh, in first episode patients compared to healthy controls and we also found another uh, effect of group on the parameter and you can see here that also uh, in addition to that the coupling strength kappa or uh, was reduced in the first episode psychosis patients and uh, we then uh, investigated whether these parameters were of clinical relevance uh, of course keep in mind that this is a, a quite small sample although i i would like to say that it's really difficult to get these first episode patients uh, and and uh, yeah and motivate these clinical populations to participate because it's uh, yeah they have other problems at the time when they when they're hospitalized the first time and uh, we are very grateful that uh, this many participated and um, in terms of this uh, data here now I, I would still caution to uh, not over interpret these correlations but they're interesting nonetheless so um, we computed Spearman correlations uh, for M3 here and uh, this parameter that uh, that we found to be different in patients positively correlated with the PANS positive symptoms. However, this did not survive morphonic correction and uh, positive symptoms are symptoms where uh, there is an additional something that comes on top of the normal function, for example, hallucinations, but also delusions in which we were particularly interested. And kappa correlated negatively with pans negative symptoms, and this survived Bonferroni correction for all the parameters. And this is, uh, these are symptoms where um, the function that is usually there is diminished or uh, or missing. And for example, the effect could be blunted here. All right. So um, going back to our original hypothesis, so what did we find here? How can we place this into into the theory that we outlined before? So basically what, what we found was a reduced belief position because if you uh, perceive the environment as increasingly volatile, uh, then this will lower the belief precision in the early, uh, in the first episode of psychosis patients. And what about uh, the later stages? So this is data that uh, Andrea and Katharina uh, Wellstein collected in, in back in Zurich uh, using the same paradigm, the same social learning task. Uh, but uh, with a subclinical population. And they screened a lot of people, or I think over a thousand uh, participants and uh, looked at their levels of paranoid delusions because uh, these paranoid delusions occur uh, not only in clinical populations, but also in the healthy control populations and uh, basically increase in intensity. Um, and they made sure that these beliefs were stable by inviting the same person twice and invited a, a subset of these participants on the low end of paranoid delusions and on the high end of paranoid delusions back into the lab to perform this task. And they were exposed to two uh, different frames, experimental frames. There was a dispositional frame, which uh, uh, directed participants' attentions toward the uh, advisor and that this person may have goals that were differing from the player's goals and could uh, potentially uh, yeah, try to uh, deceive the player. And there was a situational frame which directed uh, the player's attention to the rules of the game and emphasized that the person could also give uh, wrong advice without meaning to, because the advisor did not have perfect information. And again, uh, uh, Andrea and Katarina compared these two different mechanisms. And in this case, the vanilla version of the HGF was actually winning. And uh, what they found uh, here is an interesting interaction effect between the group. So whether people had um, high levels of persecutory delusions and the frame effect. So you can see here uh, the learning rate omega plotted as a function uh, of the group in the frame. You can see that actually uh, 
in the low paranoia group when uh, participants were informed that the advisor uh, might have different intentions and and their atten attention was directed towards the advisor they actually uh, updated their beliefs more so they paid more attention to that and learned more about the advisor however it was if it was situational their learning rate was lower so they uh, learned less and uh, this shows some adaptivity here in this context depending on the context participants could regulate their learning rate and uh, in the high paranoia group the learning rate was uh, identical across the two conditions so they did not uh, show this uh, adaptation to the context and overall it was lower and uh, this basically can be interpreted as uh, an increased reliance on the prediction because you learn less and in conclusion so we learned about or we yeah we capitulated the model which formalizes the, the uh, agf which has these different levels and applied to this task the third level represents the belief about volatility or of the volatility of the intentions of the advisor second level represents the advisor's or the belief about the advisor's fidelity and um, the bottom level uh, is still the prediction of categories here and in terms of what we found we found that m3 was increased uh, leading to an oversensitivity to upcoming prediction errors and this was present in in early psychosis where we might assume that participants had something which is called a delusional mood so uh, the uh, phase that comes before delusional conviction and in the subclinical population we found that uh, omega-2 was uh, lower and this uh, would lead to sticky priors on fidelity and this was the case in, in those participants uh, that were showing high levels of subclinical paranoia and um, associated with delusional conviction here all right, so with that, I would like to answer any questions that are uh, that, that people might have at this point. And if there are no questions, then we will jump into the practical part. Are there any questions? I cannot see them because I'm <laughs> sharing my screen. Yeah, so. no problem. I'm, I'm monitoring it. Uh, there's no new questions. Um, uh, actually, there is a question in the chat from Reza. Um, do you think uh, tools like design of experiments could be applicable to approximate uh, micro environmental volatility? Design of, I, I don't know this tool to be honest. Yeah, um, um, me neither. Um, but maybe just maybe something to, to add there related to that question. Um, so, one can so we've talked about these two different types of uh, hgfs uh, at the beginning of the lec on lecture one that we had the uh, hgf as a generative model of the input and hgf as a model of beliefs um so on the on the side of the generative model of the input um you can um, um you can uh design an experiment um, by sort of injecting the adequate number of volatility that allows you to best differentiate these parameters that you're interested in or best differentiate the models that reflect mechanisms that you're interested in. So you, yep. your objective function could be identifiability of let's say kappa and omega and then on the side of the design you can find sort of the optimal level of volatility that would address this um, distinction. Yeah. Um, the Minitab software is um, um, mentioned by Reza, but I'm also not familiar with it. So maybe uh, some of these things are clear now, um, or they will become clear uh, with the tutorial. Yeah, I think we can move yeah. on to the code. Maybe, maybe just uh, just an addendum there. So, uh, of course, also if you if you are interested in volatility prediction errors, let's say. Um, then if your design does not have any volatility, this uh, the expression of these prediction errors may be reduced. So uh, if you have a design that is basically a constant structure, then uh, your uh, 
ability to identify that whether or not people have these uh, or learn about volatility might be reduced. So uh, there's definitely ways to, to uh, uh, there are things that you need to con take into account with, when designing these experiments, if you're interested in particular parameters. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, if you have a design um, that lacks volatility, for example, that doesn't mean that the agent will not infer on the change in context. Um, and the assumption is that, uh, you know, it, it goes back to evolutionary theory and natural selection. The assumption is that it is uh, adaptive to infer on um, the tendency or the reward uh, expectation of states in the world, but also on their volatility to be able to regulate one's learning rate given abrupt changes uh, in, in, in the environment, such as food access, uh, predators, and so on and so forth. So it, it is still a valid assumption to say that agents will still predict volatility, even if you yes. don't have it in your design, but it is better when you have it in your design because then you can actually test it better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is what, what I meant when I, when I said basically it's your ability to, to find it is reduced. So it's, it's just harder to track it, but, um, all right. Um, then with that, uh, let's go to the MATLAB uh, window. So maybe you could all open your MATLAB if you haven't done so and um, navigate to the day six folder here of the summer school. And once you're inside that folder, uh, you need to be in, at this level here. You can run the command KCNI set up uh, paths. And this should uh, set up your local paths uh, on, on your personal computer um, so that we can find all the relevant information. And once you have done this, you can go to the HDF tutorial inside this HDF tutorial folder here. And there will be two scripts, uh, HDF tutorial generate task and HDF tutorial generate learner. So if you go to the generate task script, uh, which I opened here, you can open it in the uh, in the editor by dragging it over here. And um, yeah, so this first tutorial, part of the tutorial is basically to design to uh, show you the first steps of using the HF. So we will uh, generate an experimental design. We will generate a probability structure and corresponding experimental inputs. And then we will simulate an ideal observer. Uh, and also simulate responses from that observer. And then I will show you how to invert the model. This is the part that's relevant when you want to invert the model on your own data. And then we will inspect this model uh, and parameter identifiability and what belief trajectories were inferred. And then we will compare this in the last part to a simpler model, the Riscola Wagner model. And this, these are the defaults here. So I, I set a random seed to make sure that we see the same thing. Uh, this is also handy if you want to run simulations and want to have the results reproducible. And I also set the ac access font size and this might or might not be appropriate to your computer. I just wanted it to be relatively large so that you can see it uh, well, but you might need to change this value. So feel free to change this. And now we will go uh, through the script section by section. So you can run a section uh, either if you go to the editor tab here, you can either run the whole script, you can run a, a section in advance or run a section. And we will use one of those options. So I will press the uh, run an advance button here. And this uh, created the random seed here. So this is all that happens in this part. Let's try to generate a probability structure now. So here I uh, included 10 blocks where the uh, volatility is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, and so forth. So this would be the probability of the advice being uh, good or bad in, in, in the example that I just gave you, how many trials there will be pro block, uh, per block. And yeah, and the rest is just automatic things that I needed. And then I will create the volatility structure and plot it. So if you press run section here, you can see that uh, 
this probability structure basically has a stable phase and then there's a phase that is volatile and then there's another stable phase. Now let's just generate some input uh, uh, that a person, a participant might see and I'm using a very simple way to generate this input by just sampling from, the, from a binomial distribution that has this uh, probability structure that I just showed you. Uh, of course, uh, Andrea alluded to that the idea would be that there is a generative model in the environment that generates these inputs and you can also simulate from the generative model uh, itself, but for simplicity, we just use this uh, fast way here. And these green dots are basically the sampled inputs. So you have the advice helpful, helpful, misleading at the bottom here, for example, this could also be something else. Uh, depending on your task and design. And you can see that there's more uh, of one in these cases here. All right, so one, um, one other uh, thing that Andrea also discussed in her lecture already is that um, we might need to uh, find priors. And uh, I can show you now uh, what the actual model looks like. So in the tutorial folder, there, there is this folder PSD models, which stands for perceptual models and observational models. This is the response model. We we'll just go into this model here and I can show you what you usually have. Uh, there are four files for the perceptual model uh, and five files for the response model. And uh, you have the config file, which specifies the prior, the prior. So there's a lot of documentation here. You can give it a name. Uh, a number of levels and and these are the priors here and they're usually the parameter name underscore the level and then whether it's a mean or a variance so the parameters are specified by their sufficient uh, sufficient statistics the mean and the variance and if you wanted to fix one parameter so this is basically the mu 30 that um, i mentioned in one of the models uh, where, where the question came up what it means. So this is where you would specify this parameter. And if you want to estimate it, you have to have a positive value of on the variance here. If you set it to zero, then um, this would basically mean the parameter is fixed. And you also can set the prior variance and uh, drift rate, for example. This is the M. And kappa. Kappa uh, is estimated in, in logit space. So there is a bound, at least in this version, this is an older version of the HEF that, that we're using. There are other versions where it's also specified in log space, but in this case, so there might be some parameters that are bounded. And I will also show you what, what this would look like. So I put in the, uh, if you go back to the HEF tutorial fo folder in the utilities, you can find a function that's called demo plot HEF priors. And this function is helpful to understand what the priors actually look like. So you have, uh, you can specify means, uh, variances, and uh, a bound, for example, one. This is only uh, necessary for the logit uh, transformation. And then you can specify a transformation function, log, lo a logit, or net, which is just no transformation. And if you were to run this script, um, I will just run the whole script now. You can basically see here you specify these different prior means and variances. We didn't change the mean, but we changed the variance. So that would become flatter if the variance increases. But then after the transformation, uh, you can actually see that this might have some unexpected effects that you should be aware of when specifying the priors of your model. So if you, uh, for example, had a mean of zero and a variance of uh, 0.1, you would have a very uh, steep prior on this value of 0.5. As you increase the variance, this would become flatter and uh, around a variance of two would be quite flat. And then something funny happens. So if you increase the variance further, you would actually have a prior that expects either very low or very high values here. So this is something to, to keep track of. Going back to the, to the uh, config file. So uh, the sigmas are usually specified in log space because they can only be positive. The variances can only be positive. And 
let's go back to the other model files. So there's a function named p. This parameter, uh, this function just uh, puts the parameters into a nice structure again that you can read them easily after they're estimated. There's a function transpose p which transforms the parameters in the right space. And there's the actual model itself, which is just the name of the model. And you can see that the parameters are unpacked and these uh, update equations are basically found down here uh, for the different levels. And just to illustrate what happens in the observational model, you can see that this has five uh, functions here. And the function that comes uh, on top of the ones that we've seen already is uh, a function uh, which is called model name underscore sim or simulation. And this function actually generates uh, a, pr a probability, for example, by drawing from a binomial distribution here. And this uh, is actually used later to generate responses from parameters, which you, of course, only need uh, in the um, observational model. All right, let's go back to the task. So just to clear it up, I will just run it again from, from scratch. So we see the input structure, the inputs. And now uh, what we are going to do is we simulate parameters. And uh, Andrea already mentioned that these priors are actually um, have to be set by the by the experimenter because we're using Bayesian inference, and that this might or uh, might not be a bad thing because um, frequentists sometimes argue that it's very subjective. But um, you can also think uh, in the context of a linear regression, for example, if you if you follow a frequentist approach, you would have uh, in a, uh, essentially a uniform prior on all the possible values. And let's take a regression where you standardize your data and you would have betas. You're basically saying a beta of 1 trillion is as likely as a beta of zero, which from my experiences at least might not be the case if you standardize the data beforehand. So in a Bayesian setting, you could say that uh, I know that the beta is probably not going to be large, largely different from zero and could have a shrinkage prior centered on zero and let the data convince you that it's not zero. So this would be one, one way to, to set a prior. And another way to do this would be to use uh, an, a, a normative prior. So we can basically simulate what good parameters would be given the input structure. And this is what we are doing here, <clears throat> which you could then use as a prior for your uh, participants. And this is actually quite interesting if you, if you want to model participants where some people might argue that they do not behave as they should. You're basically saying a priori, I assume everybody is uh, base optimal given the input and I let the data convince me otherwise. And this is what we're doing here. Uh, and it, the way it works is basically use the tuppers fit model function. Uh, you don't pass an input, so the, uh, uh, don't pass responses. So this would be the place where you usually uh, pass the participant's behavior. You only pass the input. And then you have to choose a perceptual model function uh, and the configuration function of that. And uh, the observational model function, if you choose the tuppers base optimal binary function here, this will then try to find the base optimal parameters for the perceptual model. And the third part of uh, or the other argument here is the optimization function. You can also uh, leave that away because it's uh, this would be the default, so the quasi-Newton optimization algorithm here. But if you want to write your own, I, the toolbox is written module, uh, in, in, in modules. You could add different ways to, to find the parameters to it. Let's run this again by run section. Uh, OK, two things happened here. You can see in the output here that uh, it looked for uh, ignore trials or irregular trials. So this would be missing trials because we just uh, use input. There are no missing trials. Uh, then it's uh, optimizing the model parameters. And it's outputting the parameters for the perceptual model here. And for uh, it's also outputting uh, measures of model quality. This is the log model evidence or the free energy. 
which we use for model comparison, for example. And there are other metrics here, which you might already be familiar with, which is the ICAICA information criterion and the BIC, the Bayesian information criterion. These are all ways to compare different models. And another thing happened, you, you got these trajectories here. And I will spend some time now to walk, uh, walk you through this because this is something that will come back uh, quite a lot. So you can see here basically the different levels of the hierarchical Gaussian filter and, the and how these states evolve over time. So this would be the highest level state. So uh, in the case of the example, the volatility of the intentions and you can see how it uh, evolves over time and the shaded area is the uncertainty around that state. And um, at this mu2, in, in our example, this would be the uh, advice validity, which uh, lives on a scale that ranges from infinitely negative to infinitely positive. And you can see how that evolves in time. And in the case of the example here, uh, the low bottom state is basically just a sigmoid transformation of the state. So bringing bring the range to uh, zero, to a range between zero and one here, and one would be high probability of the advice being helpful and zero high probability of the advice being not helpful uh, or low probability of the advice being helpful because it's binary. And um, I also plotted the in the dashed line here, the input structure, and you can see that this optimal agent uh, appears to learn this input structure. And whenever there's an outlier, it uh, updates away from it, but then as there are more and more of, of uh, helpful advice, the, the person starts to learn that. And this is what it looks like. And let's now simulate uh, be, uh, behavior for using these parameters. And you can do so by using Tapa sim model. So this allows you to simulate the input. Then you have to input again, the perceptual model, the perceptual model parameters, which are stored in this structure that we uh, got here, bow parse. And we can take a look at this. So this has no responses because we didn't pass any. It has some input and it has the configuration, the prior configuration. And in the P underscore PRC is the posterior parameter estimates. Uh, and the uh, OBS would be the observational model here, the prior. So in this case, we use the base optimal and the posterior of the observational model because we didn't use any uh, observational model here. This is what it looks like. And then in Optim, you can find things that are uh, important. So you can find the log, log model evidence. You can find ASC, BIC, the residuals, um, uh, the covariance matrix of the parameters and the correlation matrix of the parameters and other things, which I will walk you through in a, in a minute. But let's first now um, simulate responses. So we again input the perceptual model and the parameters and we use an, this time we use a different uh, observational model, uh, just a unit square, which is just a sigmoid transformation basically. And we set the noise parameter to a fixed value here and uh, we simulate responses. And these are the, the orange dots here. And you can see that uh, this would be the responses expected under the model from a person that have these parameters here. And I would just show you omega and theta for now. All right, so how do we invert the model? So now we have simulated data, but we want to actually know what happens if you have collected your own data. And the way to do this is uh, you again call tapas fit model, and then you pass it the responses. So we can look at this. This is just a vector of ones and zeros going with and against the advice in our case. And uh, the input, which is uh, the experimental input that you controlled that you have to determine in the designing your experiment. And then again, you pass a perceptual model an observational model and uh, the optimization algorithm, although you don't need to do that, it will default to this one. If you want to change it, you need to pass it. Again, run section. 
So what I plotted here now is the parameters that we use for the simulation. So the true parameters, so to say, uh, which were omega equal to minus 2.449 and then the recovered parameters. So we now use the behavior that we simulated and want to, want to see whether the recovery of the parameters is good. And you can see that they're quite similar, although theta might be a little bit different. Uh, and you can use this way basically to assess once you have parameters or even a priori, how well you would be able to recover parameters and plot the correlation. You can conduct this simulation uh, many, many times and uh, look at the scatter plot of that. Now we want to understand this model a little bit better. So we want to um, uh, plot some diagnostics, uh, run this section. So there are two things. This is plotting the uh, posterior parameter correlation matrix. So how correlated are the parameters? And of course on the diagonal would be the, uh, uh, they're always perfectly correlated with themselves. So this is once that's to be expected. And what we want to see now is basically that there's little values. So neither very negative or very positive values on the diagonal here. And uh, this looks quite okay. Because if there was, for example, a one here on the diagonal, this would mean that uh, basically changing one parameter uh, is equivalent to changing another parameter. In this case, you can simply not interpret both of them. So you would need to fix one of them. Um, this would be, for example, a solution to this problem. Or you might need to use a different design uh, to identify these parameters. Yeah. And uh, the posterior correlation matrix is stored uh, in this part of the code. So in the optim, I showed you that and the covariance matrix is stored here. And you can also display the posterior parameters. So now we will go to what it will look like if you actually estimate it. So now you do have responses in the model. You do have you, you might have ignored trials. So in this case we didn't, but we could add some missing responses here. Um, and you have the prior safe with it and the posteriors are here again. And yeah, they're stored uh, in these interpretable fields. So in the mu, the first value corresponds to the lowest level and the first, the second, or depends on how you count the second and third, the initial prior variances and so forth. And you also have a vector of the parameters and the vector of the parameters in the transpose space. And you also have these trajectories and uh, you can see here that we have the means, the variances, uh, the predicted uh, uh, states, predicted variances, the prediction errors. So th this is basically what we plotted uh, in the trajectory plot. All right, let's look at, at these trajectories and this function tapas underscore HGF binary plot triage actually allows you to do that. And I'm also plotting the volatility structure on top of it. So if we run this section here, you can see um, that this would be the trajectories that we uh, would infer based on the participants behavior. And now let's compare that to a scholar Wagner model. So we will again call this uh, script tapas fit model, but we use a different perceptual model, the Scola Wagner model and the rest stays pretty much the same. And we run this section. And you can see that this uh, model basically only assumes the lowest state and you have this learning rate alpha, which is 0.23 and it's just one learning rate. And you can see that this is also able to learn the input structure here. And the uh, parameter correlation matrix um, uh, looks also fine. But let's try to understand. So uh, this is uh, also something that Andrea discussed in her lecture. Let's try ag again understanding how they differ from each other. So in this uh, section, we will compare learning rates between the HGF and Rescola Wagner. And I also plotted the input and the volatility structure in the background just to, to give you a point. You can see here that at the, the Rescola Wagner is a fixed line. So this is a, a, a constant learning rate the alpha parameter at 0.23, which we just saw, is basically this uh, would be the learning rate. And you can see that the HGF assumes that the 
a learning rate dynamically changes depending on the context. So if you take this part here, for example, you can see that actually there's a lot of stability in the environment. And in this case, the learning rate would drop actually here of the HEF, both at the uh, second and, uh, and at the high level over time. However, when there is a change in, in the context, the learning rate would shoot up again and allow you to learn faster about this new change. So this is one way to understand this learning rate. And you can also see that the learning rate after experiencing this volatility at the high level is still higher compared to the beginning. All right. Um, this was the first <laughs> part of this tutorial. And um, I think we could take maybe one or two questions, but then I also want to show you how to generate uh, uh, learners and prototypical patients maybe, or, or persons. Are there any questions at this stage? Or should we continue with that and do the questions afterwards? I don't see any questions uh, in the chat or Noren ask a question. Um, no. All right, then I, I think we should continue because I think you might find this uh, part even more interesting and you can get more active now. So I would prefer to, to continue with that and then uh, let you uh, try out things after, and then we can, uh, I can, in the meantime, I can answer questions. So we're going to the HEF tutorial generate learner script now. Um, I would just uh, type in clear, which uh, clears all the previous results. Um, and we have a clean uh, workspace here. Again, we will send the default here, set the default and generate the design this is just repetition. So it looks still the same. <laughs> uh, I will not go over this. We will generate optimal um, parameters given the input. Uh, in this case, uh, so this is only for the perceptual model again, but we use a slightly different version. So this time we use the model that also allows us to control this drift, just to mention that here. And uh, which is in the script I showed you before. And again, this is what it looks like. We turned the drift off, so it doesn't really do much. I uh, know uh, it's actually not turned off. It's uh, just drifting back towards the prior. So it looks quite similar to what we saw before, but now we can do something interesting. So one, one way to understand your model is to change the parameters and see what it would do to the belief trajectories and the behavior. So, uh, and this part three here in line 80 will allow you to do that. So I wrote some functions that help you to do that, but um, this is basically just for this model and might change. You might need to adjust it to other models if you're interested in other models. And uh, let's look at the parameter kappa. So you can set a parameter here. One of those options are okay for now. And um, and what this part, section does, it simulates under different levels of this parameter. And we then plot uh, all these uh, trajectories together. So let's look at what happens when we simulate from for different kappa values. All right, so I uh, plotted all the belief trajectories on top of each other. In the in green here, you can, or in these bluish, greenish colors, you can see the predicted responses. Black are the inputs that the person sees. And uh, you can actually see here that kappa, because it control, uh, controls the coupling, has a large uh, impact on on these uh, on the highest level, and it leads to the, the higher kappa is, the stronger the coupling, and the more updates happen on this level here, especially when the context changes. And you can uh, also we can also use that because you asked uh, or one of you asked about this M three parameter. We can also look at what M three does, and understand that. And so you can see that um, basically what M3 does, so if it's positive, uh, then you would have a drift towards a, this number basically, so towards three. And uh, and the positive values mean uh, that you perceive the environment as more volatile and negative is more stable here. And you can see the consequence of, of having this drift there uh, on the estimate of the advice volatility, uh, advice validity here in, in, in the example. So if you if you um, are a learner that uh, perceives the environment as increasingly stable, then this would lead to flatter 
uh, belief trajectories at the second level. And you can even see how this would change behavior. So the dark blue dots are the ones where you have you are more stable, you perceive the environment as more stable. And you can see that th this leads to sort of a, a delay with respect to the input structure because you perceive the environment as more stable over time. It takes you longer to notice the change. Whereas if the volatility is high, you would actually notice this change faster. So you can see, even see by eye that these uh, behavioral predictions would change under M3. And there's a second parameter that we could look at, uh, for example, the phi. This is the drift rate and uh, we kept that fixed. I can show you what it would do. It basically just changes how much you, how fast you would drift to this point here. One problem with estimating phi and M3 is that they tend to be highly correlated. So uh, I would definitely advise looking into that before estimating both. Um, yeah, and you can play with uh, what the consequences of omega are, which might be interesting for you um, and other parameters. And in the last part now, we can use uh, our our knowledge now about how the parameters affect these trajectories and behavior to think about a, a condition. It can be a clinical condition, uh, maybe a patient population, it can also be uh, different learner types uh, that you can think of uh, in, uh, uh, and try to simulate two artificial agents that behave this way. Maybe one important thing, uh, thing to mention about these simulations here is that while we change one parameters, uh, one parameter here, we kept the other parameters to the base optimal um, uh, parameters that were uh, identified with this uh, base optimal binary config function. Of course, you could also in principle change multiple parameters, but uh, we will just do one for now. And uh, let's just give uh, the simulation a name. So this is another part of the script where you can feel free to play with that around. You can call it whatever you like, whatever you want to simulate. Uh, you can simulate two artificial agents and call them patient one and two, healthy controls, um, I don't know, condition one or two and um, choose a parameter. I just, for illustration purposes, I actually did uh, choose M3 and uh, set it to a value. Uh, and you should probably use the range of values that uh, that I uh, suggested in this uh, in these plots here in the section above. You can also go into get HA parameter index function, which uh, suggests a range of values that should work. If you go inside that, you might actually not be able to invert the model. Um, because the parameters violate the model assumptions, but you can try it out if you want to. And going back to the second agent here, uh, we simulate again uh, a different parameter M3 and run this section. And you can see that we just plot these two people on top of each other. And you can now see that uh, actually maybe even better than before, what the behavioral consequences would be and also the trajectories, how they would change. Uh, if we were to simulate from different M3 values. Yes, and uh, with that, I, I'm done with the uh, tutorial. So I think um, we still have some time. So do you have any questions? Uh, and I would invite you to actually try this out yourself because the best way to to get used to it is just to use, to use the scripts, I think. and um, to try to look at different parameter changes or try to simulate your own artificial agents. Yes, then with that, I will be happy to answer more questions and probably stop sharing my screen for now. Okay, um, any questions or shall we go over anything else from the audience? Okay, so um, just uh, waiting to see if um, anyone has um, any questions, just um, maybe a few remarks. 
Um, the way we um, we choose the models or we choose how we uh, parameterize um, our models in the config file depends very much on um, the task that you're utilizing to tap onto cognitive processes or abnormal beliefs. That's that's really um, that's really important here. Um, also, your choice of regularizing or not. Um, is is also dependent uh, on your task um, and uh, and the number of trials you have and so forth. And in um, computational psychiatry, we're also um, interested in in probing specific symptoms using these tasks. So there's a question from Reza. Um, Reza, would you like to come to join us uh, on screen to ask your question? I'm wondering. I'm wondering which part of the U3 graph might be considered as distortion or noise, if any. Uh, which is the U3 graph that you? So is it the the the, the, the you're talking about the when we changed M3 or? Um, yeah, I have a feeling he's referring to M3. Yeah, um, me too. Um, so let's just answer that, and if if we are wrong, yeah, or mu mu three. <laughs> yeah, I think he's referring to the predicted volatility, um, and which is driven by the uh, M three by the equilibrium point. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mean, you can test this basically by running uh, many simulations. So because I I just fixed it now, uh, it could actually be that if we change the seed, that probably would change a bit. And you can test this by running many simulations and see what patterns emerge, where you would uh, see differences that are not driven by noise. And uh, it also depends on um, the exact way on how you incorporate that um, highest level into your response model. So in, in the simulation that I use now, uh, all right, perfect. Uh, uh, if in the simulation I use now, basically I didn't, um, I didn't uh, use M3 in the response model, but in, in the in the things that we presented before, we did use it. So in, in the case of the simulations that you're looking at right now, uh, in the tutorial script, the impact on behavior may be different than if you uh, incorporate that into the response model as well. And this is something that Andrea also mentioned that basically um, there, there are response models that have been um, quite successful in, in, in previous studies or identified as being better models, basically that incorporate the M, M U3 as well in the response model, such that when the um, the volatility is high, you would, uh, you would behave more stochastically, so you would explore more. And um, when the, uh, the environment is more stable, you would, uh, you would behave more, more deterministic or more exploitative. Um, yeah. But uh, and this might ex exactly be a question to investigate with, with simulations beforehand um, so that you can determine whether they, uh, a change in parameter actually leads to noticeable behavioral changes. And this will actually give you a hint of wh whether you can distinguish the models also. Yeah, exactly. And, and that idea of uh, volatility driving the mapping between beliefs and decisions is also akin to um, the active inference framework of this idea of trade-off between um, expected utility and uh, epistemic knowledge. So the idea is that when the environment is stable, you want to maximize uh, reward and you select behaviors that would lead you towards that path. Um, but when um, the environment is volatile, you want to learn very quickly and adapt very quickly. So epistemic value is prioritized in that case. Okay, um, any other questions? So one other thing I wanted to um, highlight about the HGF is that it's a very generic model. So you might think about, well, I have a, I want to model, let's say hopelessness in major depression. Uh, can I use the HGF for that? And the, 
the answer is that absolutely, if you if you can use the Riscola Wagner model, uh, if you use any uh, reinforcement learning model uh, that follows this kind of delta rule, you can use the HGF. Um, um, but what is important to consider is, you know, how do you test hopelessness? What? How do you design? Um, how do you do, do you design your task? Uh, what type of outcomes are the participants learning about? Um, and and that might um, determine what type of HGF you might want to use. So we've been talking about um, the, the these two different types of HGF. So Daniel has referred to the vanilla HGF, which is the HGF for binary choices. Um, but you can also consider the autoregressive model, the uh, ornstein ullenbeck process that you talked about, the mean reverting model that posits that beliefs do not only change as a function of precision weighted prediction errors, but they have this additional um, drift uh, away or towards the prior. Um, and you can think of that as kind of a, a built in, let's say an emerging bias over the course of the task, or you can think of it also as a, as a form of forgetting. Um, so you know, um, you revert to your priors over time, uh, slowly. Um, so you, you, there are many different considerations upon choosing um, the type of HGF that is suited uh, to your task, but as a whole, the model is uh, very generic. Yeah, maybe just to, to add, I think in the original, uh PhD dissertation of Christoph, you also applied it to stock market or, or exchange rates or something like that. So it's, it's I mean, I, even better suited for continuous uh, states because then you don't have the sigmoid transformation or you can map it to something uh, that is within a certain range. There have been applications to modeling reaction times as well, although this is uh, a little bit tricky as well. Yeah, and, 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 um inferring on continuous um, input and robustly estimating parameters could be done with much fewer trials in that case. So you don't need these long uh, binary uh, decision tasks, but you could have much shorter tasks. Um, do you think this stability refers to the decision to select between steady state versus real state conditions? Um, yeah, so steady state, you mean patterns that um, that are uh, kind of repeated on on and off versus uh, real state conditions. Do you mean that reflect the uh, stochasticity of the environment itself? So one thing I wanted I want to note about let's say steady state. Um, let's say you have a um, um, a task that follows a certain pattern like on again, off again, on again, off again. In principle, the HGF can, can learn um, this uh, structure uh, of, the, of the input, uh, this kind of overarching pattern of the input. And at some point at the higher level, the learning rate about the volatility will decrease if you have a repeating pattern. Um, and and we've been thinking about this in the context of the aud auditory oddball task, uh, you know, which which is um, violations of statistical regularities that could occur at the local level from tone to tone, or at the global level on the on the you know end of melodies, for example, at the level of melodies or or trains of sounds. Um, so so the model should be able to learn this after after several trials, much faster if you have a continuous input as opposed to a binary one. Okay, any other questions? Um, so I think we can continue um, the discussion on gather town because I think uh, it would be nice to give uh, people also the opportunity to have lunch and a little break, um, but we're really happy to, to chat further on gather town. Um, so uh, see you there, uh, play around with the code. Uh, we have also an assignment on Git that you could, you could follow uh, to create your own aberrant learners. Um, so uh, yeah, enjoy and see you in a bit.
Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for a great tutorial. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, enjoy your lunch or breakfast or whatever you, you're having. And see you in Gatterton. See you there.